Do you like epic games, games that tell a story? Do you look for these unique PlayStations that you remember for 20 years? Hello fellow gamers, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu and you're watching my series of video where I tackle the rules of heavy games. And not only the rules, also some few basic strategies to help you feel comfortable at the game table. So here we go, it's time to overcome my delicious French accent and take a seat together in front of that heavy game box. Welcome my friends, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu. And today in Jean-Michel Grosjeu's workshop, we will actually play together Nevsky, a game by Volko Renki, published by GMT Games. And we will learn its rules step by step from practical examples. During our game, each new rule will come on a handy pop-up panel, each panel becoming more and more exhaustive as we go on. In the first video, we will play the first game turn and learn all the basics. In the second video, we will play a second game turn and dive deeper into the rules. And finally, in a third video, I'll bring back all the panels you previously saw and put them together into useful player aids that you will download and print from BoardGameGeek. Okay, so today the game we will dive into together is Nevsky by Volko Renki, published by GMT Games. Volko Renki, as you know, is the highly praised designer of the famous Coin series, Coin Eyes Counterinsurgency, a game system designed to study and simulate wars of guerrillas. To this day, the Coin series encompass 11 games from Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars to Modern Warfare in Afghanistan. Okay, and after all these years working on this game system, Coin, Volko Renki decided to explore some new horizons of military history. And that's what he did here with Nevsky and his new series Levy and Campaign, Nevsky being the first game of the series. Levy and Campaign is a study of what it was to fight a war during the Middle Ages, and especially at an operational scale. As you know, there are some famous war games about Middle Ages wars at a strategic scale, and some also at a tactical scale. But there's something very unique about the operational scale that was never explored before. During these times, war wasn't really fought between countries, but between lords. Each lord ruling over his own land with his own private army, and whenever some high-level power, like the Catholic Church, for example, was willing to launch a conflict at a bigger scale, it needed to recruit several of these lords and convince them to fight together and long enough to win the war. On the field, the main challenge was to manage supply for all the troops, because in these difficult times, roads were scarce and bad, especially during winter. And that's what this new series is all about. Levy and campaign. Levy troops and lead them in campaign. Now, let's take a look at the map of this series' first game, Nevsky. This is the year 1240, but where are we? We are in northeastern Europe, and especially in Livonia, a mosaic of pagan territories wedged between the rising power of the Catholic and Orthodox churches. More precisely, to the west and north, three large and powerful kingdoms, Sweden, Denmark, and the German Empire. They follow a papal bull from Pope Gregory IX back in 1226, asking them to convert these territories into Catholic lands. This is the first player, and we can say that this player embodies the Pope and the Catholic Church. On the other side of Lake Pipus, as the second player, the Republic of Novgorod, the strongest state of northern Russia. Mainly, Novgorod was a stranding center between Europe, Russia, and the North Sea. And Novgorod was ruled by a town council called the Vetche, an assembly of the wealthiest merchants. Novgorod could hardly defend itself and relied upon princes like Yaroslav, his two sons Alexander and Andrei, and their private armies. Okay, so our game begins when the Catholic legate William of Modena, in the name of the Pope, asked to Hermann, Bishop of Dorpat, and the Order of the Teutonic Knights to launch an attack against the Novgorod Republic. 
And so here we start, just when Herman and two other lords from the Teutonic side are ready to launch their attack against an unprepared Novgorod. This is the setup for the campaign game Crusade on Novgorod. There's a border in the center of the map. Teuton territory is on the left of this border. All the regions, towns, castles and cities here are friendly to the Teuton player. And all these locations, rule call them locales, are linked by ways, trackways in light brown, waterways in white. Teutonic armies naturally start the campaign on the left side of the border. First of all, Hermann, Bishop of Dorpat, the main lord in the Teutonic alliance. Then Yaroslav, a Russian lord who was previously kicked out of his city of Pskov and now joined Hermann to retake his land. And Knut and Abel, the brothers princes of Denmark, coming from the north to take their part in the raids. Each lord has his own mat with his own private army, wedges for horses and bars for foot troops. On each mat, you also find assets and transports the army brings with it. Ok, and before going further, we must yet take a look at the calendar, just above the map. It runs from summer year 1240 up to spring year 1242. It is subdivided in 40-day periods for a total of 16 such periods. In gaming terms, that means the full campaign game lasts for 16 turns. Let's take a closer look at it. First, we find here all the lords that are not on the map. Three Teutonic lords and four Russian lords. The boxes these lords are located in show at what time they will become available for levy. And that is the heart of this game system. Before fighting their war on the map, each player must first convince these lords to join with their private armies. And from a historical point of view, every lord was not available as soon as summer 1240. So this calendar and the position of each lord on it show when it will be possible to levy these new forces. During the game, every turn, the turn marker will start on its levy side. This is the time when players build and maintain their forces. They muster new lords, new troops and new transport. And after that, they flip the turn marker to its campaign side and play goes to the map where armies are moved and battles are fought. Levy, campaign, levy, campaign, and we go on like this until the game is over. Now you understand why this new series of games from Volkorenki is called the Levy and Campaign series. For now, let's go back to the very first turn and let me talk about the second type of data we found on this calendar. A service marker for each lord on the map. Service markers are rectangular counters that show on the calendar when each lord will leave the war and go back home to his land and castle. Every lord has its own service marker. Players are never sure to keep a lord and his army on the battlefield. There's always a time when it will go back home if you do nothing to hold it back. Here, for example, you can see that Lord Yaroslav, who is here in Odenpe, will leave the field at the end of the next turn if the Teton player does nothing to avoid that. We'll see soon how we can pay Lord Yaroslav to ask him politely to fight a little longer. So, first game turn, summer year 1240. Hermann and his friends can levy before starting their raid against the Republic of Novgorod. Every lord on the field has a lordship rating that describes his political power over his country and his allies. This rating is found on his mat. This is the number of levy action this lord can make every turn. Let's take Hermann for example. His lordship rating is 3, so he can muster 3 times. He can muster a new lord. He can muster new troops or just new transport capacity. Let's say that with his lordship of three, he will muster one of each. First, he musters one new lord. As shown on the calendar, this turn, three Teutonic lords are available. Andreas von Felben, 
Heinrich and Rudolf von Kassel. Each of them has a filthy rating on his mat. This rating describes how easy it is to convince him to join the war. Hermann must roll this value all over to muster this lord. Andreas von Felben is a powerful lord but quite difficult to convince. So, Hermann chooses to try with Rudolf. He throws a die, 5, it's just okay for a filthy value of 5. Rudolf von Castle is mustered. He joins immediately the Teutonic Crusade, his mat is placed beside the others, and he receives his starting troops, assets, and transport. All that is printed directly on the mat. Then Rudolf von Kassel himself is put on the map. He must enter the game at a seat of his family. The seat of Rudolf von Kassel is at Castle of Venden, as shown by Rudolf's coat of arms here beside the castle. Okay, now, as any other lord on the field, Rudolf receives a marker of service to show when he will leave the war and go back home. On his mat, a service rating shows how long he will fight. For Rudolf, this rating is 2, so we put his marker of service 2 turns in the future. At the end of turn 3, if nothing is done before, Rudolf will cease fire and leave the map with his army. Note that Teutonic markers are black and Russian markers are white. And that's it. Hermann spent one point from his lordship rating for this turn, mustering Rudolf. And thanks to a good die roll, Rudolf joined the Teutonic Crusade. And now, Hermann has still two lordship points to spend during this levy. He chooses now to muster troops. The troops a lord can muster are the vassal troops printed on his mat. Every lord has his own vassals. And for every vassal, there's a rectangular marker on the Lord's mat. These are troops that are not yet in his army, but that he can rally to his cause if he decides to. As long as vassal counters are in the bottom half of the mat, they are available but not yet recruited. And so, here we are, for one point from his lordship, Hermann muster one vassal. He chooses the one he wants, and he adds to his army the troops that are printed on the vassal counter. A white triangle stands for a knight's unit, and a black rectangle for a man-at-arms unit. They go to the top half of Herman's mat with the rest of his army. They are now ready to fight. Just note that mustering troops is limited by the number of vassal counters a lord has on his mat. Herman started the game with three vassal counters, when all three of them are mustered, he won't be able to recruit new troops anymore. Okay, that's two lordship points. Hermann has one point left for this levy. And he decides to muster a transport. Very simple. For one lordship point, he can muster one transport. He can choose between a cart, a sled, or a boat. He can't muster a ship because his math states that he can't own any ship. We will see later the differences between these transports, but we can see for now that Hermann and his army are close to a large network of rivers and lakes. And because it's summer, water is not yet frozen, so it's easy to understand that he needs boats. He musters one boat and adds it to his mat. Okay, that was the levy for Lord Hermann, where he spent his three lordship points mustering one lord, one vassal and one transport. Now Hermann is done, but the other two lords can levy also the Danish Knud and Abel and Yaroslav, the Russian renegade. Note that Rudolf von Kassel cannot levy because he was just mustered this turn by Lord Hermann. He must wait until next turn to levy by himself. With the lordship rating of 3, Knud and Abel mustered 3 transports two boats and one cart. Note that they perform the same levy action three times, mustering three transport. This is okay, they spend their lordship rating as they see fit. With only one point of lordship, Yaroslav tries to muster Lord Andreas von Felben, but he rolls a three, that is not enough to convince Andreas Fielty of two. And that's all for the levy. Don't worry, we will see more details about that later, but for now, you got the basics. Before going to war, every turn, that is every 40-day period, 
Lords can always spend their lordship to levy some troops or some transport or convince some fellow colleagues to come and fight with them. Just one word before going on, levying means mobilizing your own people to go to war. And, of course, you can do that only when you are home, on your own land. As soon as your lord crosses the border into enemy territory, they won't be able to levy anymore. Teuton player always levy first, then Russian player does the same. On the other side of the border, Vladislav in the north fears an attack from Finland and let Gavrilo alone to defend Pskov, the first great city behind the border. Together, Vladislav and Gavrilo feel so weak in front of the Teutonic Crusade, and it's far too soon for them to call for the help of Alexander and Andrei, who won't become available until next year, 1241, after four full game turns. So for now, Vladislav with a lordship rating of 2, first tries to muster the only Russian lord available, Domash Tverdislavich, commander of Novgorod's militia, because it's time to wake up the people of Novgorod. With a fealty of 4, it should be easy, but Vladislav rolls a 6 and miss. With his second point of lordship, he decides to try it again. This time, he rolls a 2 and successfully muster Lord Domash. Domash settles in his only possible seat, the city of Novgorod itself, as shown by Domash's own coat of arms printed on the map. His service marker is set on the calendar four turns later because Domage service rating is 4. Ok, now because Lord Domage just arrived on the battlefield, he can't use his own lordship this turn. There remains Gavrilo with a lordship of 3. And Gavrilo decides to recruit all of his three vassals. As we will see later, such a large army would be hard to move, but Gavrilo thinks his main goal is to defend Skov against the Teutonic Wave. He does not intend to move. And now, the levy step is over. We'll see later other actions that player can do during this step, but for the moment, we will leave at that and flip the turn marker. After the levy comes the campaign. It's time to maneuver and fight. And now, let's just take a break, because before going further, it's the perfect time to learn what the goals for both players are. What do they have to do to win that war and to win the game? Easy. The Teton player must invade Russia. Invade means conquer the strongholds. A stronghold is a location whose name is written inside a box. A single box like for the fort of Izborsk, a double box like for the city of Pskov, or a triple box for Novgorod. The number of victory points the player earns for conquering a stronghold is the number of boxes. So, conquering Novgorod gives three times as many victory points as conquering Izborsk. There is a total of 13 strongholds the Teton player can conquer in Russia. Teton player can also simply ravage every Russian location, that means burning villages and fields, and that's possible everywhere, not only at strongholds. Every time Teton player ravages a location, he earns half a victory point. He can both ravage and conquer a stronghold for one, two or three victory points and a half. And that's all. The only thing Teton player has to do is to invade Russia, ravage land and conquer strongholds. And what about Russian player? Basically, his goals are exactly the same, but on the other side of the border, so he must conquer Teton strongholds and ravage Teton locations. The only difference is that there's no three-box capital city like Novgorod in Teton countries, only one and two VP strongholds. As we will see later, conquer strongholds can be retaken by their former owner, so, a conquest victory point can never be taken for granted. But that's not the case with ravaged victory points. A ravaged location stays ravaged until the end of the game, no matter what can happen. The game ends in spring 1242 after 16 game turns. The player with the most victory points is the winner. So, I let you think about it. Victory in Nevsky is a matter of attacks and counterattacks over a period of time, and that's exactly what was war in the Middle Ages. Now, 
Let's go back into the game. The levy is over and we are at the beginning of the campaign, when both players are about to establish their war plan. Let's suppose we are the Teton player. Now, before actually moving and fighting on the field, we must choose among our lords who will act and when. There is a set of three command cards for each lord. Teton player has four lords on the map, so he gets four sets of three cards plus three pass cards he can use just to do nothing. Now, to plan our campaign, we must choose cards among this set. How many? The number of cards we can choose depends on the season. Let's look at the calendar. Current turn is in summer, and in summer our plan is made of six cards. In winter, that should be four cards only, and five cards in spring. Russian people call spring Rasputitsa, the season of mud when it's quite impossible to move troops. So, six cards among 15. As Teton player, we plan to attack strongly against Pskov. Herman will be the spearhead and will strike first while Rudolf and Yaroslav will meet and join their armies under the walls of Izborsk. Okay, that's our intent. And our job now is to give them common power. Every card represents a small number of actions. The more we select cards for a lord, the more he will be able to act and react. We can select six cards. Let's say we start with two cards for Herman. This will be our main blow. Then one card for Rudolf and one for Yaroslav, and again one for Rudolf, whose army is the strongest, to give him enough power to besiege Isborg if possible. Finally, we dedicate the last card to Herman because he will have to choose where to settle knowing what happened in Pskov and Isborsk. We've decided not to give any card to Knud and Abel in the north, they will strike later, next turn possibly. And this is our war plan. All this was secret, a Russian player knows nothing about our choices. Our six cards form a deck, and while we were building our deck, the Russian player did the same, so he also has now his own deck of six common cards. And we are ready to go on the next step, where troops in the field will execute our commands, card after cards, Teton player first, then one card each until the end of both six card decks. And if you think about it, this process is a good way to simulate how lords were waging war in the Middle Ages. At that time, it was impossible to coordinate an attack between several armies. That's why every force must act on his own, and the only room for the player to coordinate his operations is to choose and sort his common cards. Ok, go on. Teton player first, always Teton player first. He flips the first card from his deck, and this is Herman as he just planned. One common card, like this one, gives the player a number of commands equal to the Lord's command rating. This rating is also shown on the command card, for Herman this is 3. That means that with this command card he can play 3 actions. 3 actions chosen among a list of 9 possible actions. The more obvious action is March, to move your lord with this army. If it comes across enemy forces, there will be a combat and this will be included in this March action. Your army marches and if it stumbles on enemy forces, it attacks. If your lord wants to attack a stronghold, he will have to set a siege. Or if he has enough strength, he can decide to storm the stronghold. And from the other side of the walls, if he is himself besieged inside the stronghold, he can try to get out to attack his besieger. This is the sally action. Every time an army moves or fights, you need to feed it. That means that you must find food where you are, this is a forage action, or ravage the country to gather food and plunder, or you can bring supply from your own country. Finally, there are two other actions, sail to make long-range raids through the Baltic Sea, and tax if you need gold to pay your own lords to keep them loyal until the end of the war and if you have nothing to do, you can still pass. So, Herman, the Teton player, can choose and perform three actions from this list. He can choose the same action multiple times. 
And after that, the Russian player will draw his first common card and do the same. If you remember, we put three Herman cards in our common deck. That means that all in all, we will play nine actions with Herman on the map during this turn. Okay, first common card, first action, Herman chooses to march. Remember, his goal is to attack Russian army in Pskov. One march action allows the Lord and his army to move along one road or river to the next location. A road, the game call it a trackway, is a light brown path. Using a trackway, Herman could go with one march action to Vaiga, Odempe or Ugonia. He can also use a waterway, a waterway is a white path. These white paths are rivers but also lake shores. So, from Dorpat, using only one march action, Herman can go to Felin, Odempe, Uzmen and even up to Narvia, Orgdorf. He aims the city of Pskov, so he decides to use the waterway to Uzmen. One march goes to the next location along a trackway or a waterway. Reaching Pskov will need two march actions. So, let's march to Uzmen. Now, take a look at what Herman is carrying with him. The upper half of his mat shows his armies. These are men and horses. They can walk on their feet, even beside the waterway. So, they can do the march action without any requirement. The bottom half of the mat shows the supply train, and especially the provender, that is mainly grain, needed to feed men and horses. This provender cannot walk by its own and must be carried by a transport. Roughly, you need one transport for one provender, and the type of transport depends on the type of way you want to take. You need carts to march on road, on trackways, you need boats to march besides rivers and lakeshore on waterways. Ok, but that's only valid in summer. In winter, roads and rivers both become path of ice, so you need sleds whether you march on trackways or on waterways. And in Russia, there's a third season called Rasputitsa, which is a season of mud. In spring, just after winter, roads become impassable because of mud. So, there is no possible transport on trackways, but you can still use boats on waterways. Beware, we are talking about the bottom half of the Lord's Mat. Never forget that fighting units, men and horses, don't need any transport in order to march. Transport is only for provender. Later, we will see that we can also feed armies with loot. Loot is just like provender, it comes from raids and pillage, and it's basically cattle, so it has legs to walk and it doesn't need any transport either. Here, Herman carries one provender, he needs one transport. He's got two boats and it's summer, so he can march along waterways. Had he wanted to march along a trackway, because he doesn't have any cart, he would have to drop his provender. Without any provender, an army can use any path, trackway or waterway in any season without any special transport counter. Transport is only for provender. So, Herman's common card gives him three actions. First action, he marches along the waterway to Uzmen. Herman and his army just crossed the border. He is now in Russian territory. As soon as he marched, even just once, he gets a move fought counter. At the end of this common card, that is after Herman's three actions, every army with this moved fought counter will have to be fed. And what does an army eat? Provender. One provender will feed all the army, two provenders if the army is seven units or larger. Ok, after this march, Herman has two actions left. And because he is now in Uzmen, on Russian territory, he decides to spend its next action to ravage this location. Ravage is a very simple action. Herman just plays a ravage marker that shows that this land is burned until the end of the game. Nothing can fix it. And this location can be ravaged again. 
Each ravage location in Russia gives half a victory point to Teton player. Remember, ravaging Russia is one of Teton player's goals. Also, ravaging means pillaging, so he also earns one provender. And if there are buildings of any sort, he earns also cattle, that is a loot counter. Here, there is no building in Uzman, so he only earns a provender. Okay, and now with his third action, he marches again to reach his target, Pskov. He carries two provenders, but he has two boats, and he moves through a waterway during summer, so it's fine. The problem now is that a Russian lord, Gavrilo, is waiting for him under the walls of Pskov. A bit later, we will see that a lot of things can happen in such a situation. Lord Gavrilo could flee or withdraw into the stronghold, starting a siege. But let's assume that Gavrilo, who just reinforced his army during Levy, feels ready to fight Hermann. He is confident, perhaps a little too much. There's a battle. Let's see what will happen. Just note for now that fighting is not an action or a command. It's a consequence of march. Its resolution is included in the march action. Now we need a battlefield. This is the battle board used every time lords are fighting. We turn it like this to show who is the attacker and who is the defender. The attacker is the one who enters the location, and both lords are put in the center, face to face. As we will see, this board is especially useful to organize far more busy battlefields, with a lot of lords on each side. This first example is very simple, just one versus one. We also put a battle marker on the map to remind where battle occurs. Then, fight begins. Units will hit each other until one side collapses. Battle is as simple as that. Horse units always hit first, and defender always before attacker. So, defenders horse first, then attackers horses, then defenders foot units, and finally attackers foot units. First defender, Russian Lord Gavrilo, he has three horse units. Horse units are triangle pieces. He has one silver unit and two wooden brown. Silver units are knights. During the Middle Ages, knights were the kings of the battlefield. Their battle value is 2. Black units are sergeants, their value is 1. And brown units are light cavalry, their value is 1 half. Gavrilo horse strength is 3, so he inflicts 3 hits on his opponent. And Hermann must right now absorb these hits. For each hit, Herman must choose one unit from his army and roll a die to see if it can absorb the hit without breaking. Each type of unit has a protection number that shows how much he needs to roll to remain steady. As you see, this protection number matches the unit color. Silver colored knights are heavily armored with a protection number of 4. Black Surgeons and Men at Arms have a regular armor that gives a protection number of 3. Brown units are unarmored and get the minimum protection number of 1. Herman chooses to absorb the first hit with a Men at Arm. Note that you can absorb a hit made by Horse unit with Foot units. You can choose whatever unit. He must roll 3 or lower. He rolls 2. That's okay, this unit absorbs one hit. Now the second hit. That same unit can be chosen again. He rolls a 4 and this time he misses. The unit breaks under the cavalry charge. It is moved to the bottom half of the mat in the routed unit's space. There's a last hit to absorb and Herman must choose another unit. He chooses a knight. This is a strong unit he doesn't want to lose but it is heavily armored and has a better chance to absorb the hit. He needs to roll a 4 or less. He rolls a 6 and misses again. His knight's unit is routed also. Now, this is the attacker's turn. Herman's horse units inflicts hits that Gavrilo's army must absorb. Herman's horse total strength is 3. Note that he doesn't count his knight's unit that were just routed by Gavrilo's cavalry charge. So, Gavrilo's army must absorb 3 hits. 
He chooses his only knight's unit first and rolls for protection. It's a miss. His unit breaks and routes. Two more hits to absorb. He wants to keep as much strength as possible for foot combat, so he absorbs again with cavalry units. Light cavalry is unarmored, so he must roll a 1 to resist. That's a miss. One more unit routes. And last hit. Light cavalry again and a miss again. Three units were routed. But now it's Gavrilo's turn again for foot assault. Gavrilo inflicts hits. Foot units are rectangular bars, black for men at arms with a strength of one and brown for militia with a strength of one half. Gavrilo's total foot strength is four, so he inflicts four hits that Herman's army must absorb. He tries with this knight's unit, he passes, then he passes again, and he passes four times. And see how a unit with a strong protection rating and a bit of luck can nullify an assault. Finally, the last step of this battle, Herman's foot troops strikes back at Gavrilo's army. Their strength is two, so two hits. Gavrilo must absorb them. With a man at arms unit first, he must roll three or less and he misses. He checks the second hit with a militia unit and he misses again. And that's it. We just run together a full round of battle. But this is not the end. In fact, from now, we start the whole cycle again and again and again until one player has no forces anymore. That means until one side's units are totally routed. Now let's enter Gavrilo's mind. He thought he had an army big enough to stop Herman before the walls of Pskov. But now, after a full battle cycle, he understands that he can lose a lot. And perhaps is it time for him to step back to save what can still be saved. Fortunately, at the beginning of each battle cycle, each player can decide to concede battle, even at the beginning of the very first battle cycle. Attacker decides first. Here, of course, Herman declares he wants to keep on fighting, but Gavrilo states that he will actually concede battle. What does it mean? First, by doing so, Gavrilo makes sure that the fight will stop, no matter what happens, at the end of the next battle cycle. Okay, that will stop the slaughter. But before that, he must still survive one full battle cycle. We put a pursuit marker to show that Gavrilo concedes. The arrows on that counter show that Herman pursues Gavrilo and the text reminds that all Gavrilo's hits will be halved during that cycle. So let's fight what will be the last battle cycle. You know the process, so I will go faster. Defenders horse units. There is no more unrotted horse units in Gavrilo's army. Nothing happens. Attackers horse units. Herman has still a strong cavalry. Gavrilo must absorb three hits. Men at arms, okay once, okay twice, but it fails on the third roll. Now, defenders foot troops. There are three militia units. That is a strength of 1.5. But because it has conceded the battle, that strength is halved for a result of 0.75. Rounded up, that gives one. One hit that Herman must absorb. He is quite confident with his knight's unit, but he failed the roll and the knights are routed. And finally, attacker's foot units, two hits. Gavrilo has no choice but to absorb it with militia. He must roll a one. First roll failed. Second passed. Okay, the second battle cycle is now over, and because Gavrilo conceded at the beginning of this cycle, now the whole battle is over. There are two ways to end the fight. First, if a player concedes, that's just what happened here. Second, if the whole army of one player is totally routed, that is, all his units are in the bottom half of his player's mat. The winner of the battle is the player who didn't concede in the first case or in the second case, the player who has still unrouted units. And now that the battle is over and we know the winner, we carry on with the consequences of the battle. First, on both sides, 
Some troops are routed in the bottom half of their player's mat. That means that these soldiers lost their cohesion and they must be rallied or they'll be lost forever. So, each side must check for their permanent losses. Easy. That's exactly the same die roll as protection roll during battle. Four or less for silver units, three or less for black units and one for brown units. They roll. All units that fail this check are permanently removed from the game. Herman loses one man at arms unit and keep all his precious knights. Gavrilo loses one militia unit and two light cavalry. Brown units in general are very precarious. But he keeps his other forces. All units that pass the roll return back to the upper half of their player's mat and recover their full strength. Okay, after taking their losses in a regular battle, the losing army must go, it must retreat. And I say in a regular battle because our particular battle precisely is not regular. But for the moment, for the sake of simplicity, let's say it is. So, the losing army must retreat. Let's have a look at the map. That means it must move to another location linked to Pskov the battlefield by a single way, a trackway or a waterway. Gavrilo can choose where he will go. He can go to Zelsha River, to Dubrovno or to Izborsk by trackway. Or he can go to Ostrov by waterway. But he can't go to Uzmen because that's where the attacking army is coming from. He can go either to any location where there's an enemy army. For example, if Rudolf's army had already arrived in Izborsk, Gavrilo could not retreat there. Now, can he retreat with all his belongings? It depends on where he chooses to go. The rule is that he can take all the provender he can carry. For example, here, Gavrilo has two provenders and two carts, so he can carry by a trackway to Delcha River, Dubrovno or Izborsk. But if he wants to retreat by waterway to Ostrov, he must give up his provenders because he has no boats to carry them along waterways. He can retreat to Ostrov, but without his provender. Nobody can retreat with loot. Loot represents cattle, which is too slow to flee before the enemy. And the loser can carry his belongings only if he makes an orderly retreat. If he conceded the battle, you remember that is, if he decided to end battle at the beginning of a round, then he retreats orderly and he can take all provenders he can carry. But if he loses battle because all his troops are routed, that is, in the bottom half of his lord's mat, retreat is a disorganized mess and he must give up all provender. Ok, but you remember, I said this battle was not a regular battle. And that's because Gavrilo has another choice. This battle was fought under the walls of Pskov. And Pskov is a stronghold. You know that because its name is written in a box. In this case, the loser has always the option to retreat inside the stronghold. The game called that a withdrawal. In that case, Gavrilo can retain all his assets provender and loot. He can keep them all behind the walls of Pskov, and from that point, there is a siege. And finally, after losses and retreats, the winner takes the spoils of war. Simple, he takes all belongings that the loser left behind. So, if the loser retreated because all his units were routed, he gives up any asset and the winner takes all. Transport, provender, loot and even coins. That's another reason to concede battle and not fight to the last man. By conceding, you lose the battle and you only inflict half damages during the last round. But, at least, you can retreat with your belongings. Note that ships are never lost this way. Because in this game, ships are heavy vessel sailings on the Baltic Sea. So, when a lord owns a ship asset on his mat, he doesn't carry it wherever he goes. And when he loses all his assets because of a route, he loses his carts, his small boats, etc. But not his large ships that still wait for him in some port.
Now, if the Lord retreats after conceding the battle, the winner just gets what the loser gives up. So, he gets all loot assets and the provender over the transport capacity. If the Lord withdraw in the stronghold, like Gavrilo in our example, the winner gets nothing. Okay, this is the end of our battle. Uh, Herman already had a moved and fought marker because he moved to reach Pskov. And we must put that same marker on Gavrilo because he fought, even if it's not his turn to do actions. He fought by defending against Herman's assault. Now that Herman's command card is over, every lord that has a moved fought marker must feed his troops. That is, Herman and Gavrilo. The cost is one provender per lord, but two if this army is seven units or greater. Herman has five units, Gavrilo six. They pay both one provender and that's fine. Both markers are discarded. And now we go on with campaign by drawing the top Russian common card. Russian card is Gavrilo. For the Russian player, it's probably a strategic mistake. Gavrilo is besieged and there's nothing he can do. The only possible action would be to go outside the walls of Skov to fight Herman again on the plain, without taking advantage of the stronghold's fortification. This is the Sally action. Gavrilo's army is clearly weaker than Herman's and it better stay behind the walls, waiting for possible reinforcements. So, he does nothing passing twice and thus spoiling his command card he hands over to his opponent. His opponent who draws Herman again as planned, three actions again, but as he is besieging Pskov, what can he do? He could storm the stronghold. Storming means breaking the gates and climbing the walls to conquer the stronghold by force. But Gavrilo's army would benefit from the stronghold's garrison and Hermann's estimates that his own forces aren't big enough for taking that risk. So, there is a second choice for Hermann to camp before the walls and wait for his opponent to weaken. This is the siege action. Siege action costs the whole command card capacity. So here, all the three actions would be used for the siege you can do another action with that same common card. Then, if there is no besieged lord inside the stronghold, you can roll a die to check if the stronghold surrenders. This is how you conquer a stronghold by siege without any battle. Here, this is not possible because there's an enemy lord inside. This stronghold will never surrender. But you can build some siege works to increase your strength for a future storm battle. But there's a problem for Lord Herman because you can build siege works only if your army has enough besieging lords. Enough means as many lords as the stronghold siege capacity written in this small circle. Pskov siege capacity is 3. The Teton player has only one lodge to siege it, so he can build siege works. And then what can he do? He can still ravage. Remember, he puts a Ravage marker, earning half a victory point, and he gets one Provender, and because there are buildings in the location, he gets also one Loot. With all these assets, it will be more and more difficult for him to move around, but his intention is to stay here until the fall of Skov, so no problem. And after that, he decides to do nothing but pass, because if he leaves and ends the state of siege, he will allow Gavrilo to leave also and save his army. Next common card, Russian player. Gavrilo again. And again, the Russian player has no choice but to stay here behind the walls of Pskov. And you understand now how important is the planning phase at the beginning of the campaign, when both players choose their common cards for the turn and put them in the desired order. The Russian player didn't anticipate Hermann's attack on Pskov, and spoiled all Gavrilo's cards because of that. Next common card, Teton player, and it's Lord Rudolf's turn. Command capacity of 3, he can do 3 actions. His goal is to join Hermann's army as quickly as possible. He could reach Isborsk in 3 marches, 
but he would have to march first along a river, a waterway, and he has no boat to carry his provender, just a cart. So he could do that move, but he would have to give up his provender. He prefers to use only trackways and keep his provender. So he prefers to bring his provender with him, even if doing so, he won't go that far. Because he moved, he received a moved fort marker, and he must feed his troops at the end of this command card. He spends one provender and feed his army. Perfect. He has no provender anymore, and he will have to find a way to gather new food, but for the moment, it's okay. Next card, Russian player. Lord Domash from Novgorod. He will run to help Gavrilo in Pskov. The problem for him is that there is no way to go from Novgorod to Pskov only by boat or by cart. His armies will have to use both trackways and waterways. That's why, when he was recruited during Levy Step, the Russian player decided to give him both carts and boats. Domash has a command rating of 2, he can do 2 actions, he can move twice by waterways to Dubrovno. Now let's remember the basics of March. One march action is a movement along one way, waterway or trackway, to the next location. But you must have enough transport to carry your provender. Domash has four provenders, but only two carts and two boats. So, whether he takes a trackway with his carts or a waterway with his boats, he only has half transport as needed. Hopefully, there is a solution. An army can exceed his transport capacity, but must use two commands per march. A lord can do that as long as his provender don't exceed twice his transport capacity. Here, that's okay, two boats for four provender, that's just twice the capacity. Domash can then use all of his two command points to move his army once to Shellon River. He must stop at Shellon River and can't go any further with this command card. But Domash has another option, he can drop all excess provender down to his transport capacity and move twice to Dubrovno. And that's what he does because helping Gavrilo in Pskov is far more important than saving two provenders. He earns a moved fort marker so he must feed his troops at the end of the command card. He spends one provender and it's okay. Next card, Toton player, Lord Yaroslav. Let's go a little faster. Two command points, he can march twice using trackways. One card for one provender, it's fine. One, two, his army arrives first in Izborsk. Let's zoom a little. So Yaroslav just entered Izborsk's location. Izborsk is a stronghold, so there's an automatic and immediate state of siege. Yaroslav is besieging Izborsk. When an army enters a location with an enemy force or an enemy stronghold, it must end his command card. Here, Yaroslav had already spent his two command points, so that doesn't change anything, but had he three common points, the last one would have been spoiled. In fact, the fort of Isborg is not empty, strongholds are always defended by an intrinsic garrison. Yaroslav could attack this garrison to seize the fort, but this is the action Storm and it needs one more common point, Yaroslav has not. And had he this one common point, he could not spend it because when you declare a siege, this put an end to your current command card. Still, Yaroslav gets his moved fort marker, he must feed his troop, he pays one provender, and it's okay. Next card, Russian player Lord Vladislav, who is far over there watching the Finland border. He has three command points and one card to transport one provender. He wants to run south to fight Toton invaders. He could march three locations up to Tesovo, but doing so, he would spend his only provender, and he is not sure that Knud and Abel, the Danish brothers, will not take the opportunity to attack along the north coast. So, Vladislav chooses wisely to march only two locations to Ingria, staying ready to go back north to intercept Knud and Abel, and keeping one command point to refill his provender stock before feeding his troops. There are three ways to gain provender during your command. The first way, we already know, it's to ravage the location you are in. But, as you can imagine, there's a problem here. 
Vladislav is in his own country, Russia, and of course, you can't ravage your own land. You can't burn your own farms and kill your own peasants. So, ravage is not an option here. There are two other ways to gain provender. Foraging is asking to your local farmers, more or less strongly, to feed your army with their crop. It is very convenient because you don't have to carry your own provender, feeding on the lands you go through. But it works only if there are any crops, that is, during summer anywhere or during other seasons, only in a friendly stronghold where there are barns full of grain. Now it's summer, so Vladislav forages and gains one provender. Because Ingria is not a stronghold, in another season, foraging would not have been possible. In such a case, there is a last solution, supply. Supply works whatever the season, and it means transporting your own provender from home. Every lord has his own home city, which is called his seat. Vladislav's seat is Ladoga, as shown by his coat of arms. From there, he must establish a supply route to his army. That means he must have one transport capacity for each way to his seat. Here, for example, from Ladoga, Vladislav's seat, to Ingria, Vladislav's current location, there are two trackways. So, with two carts, he could earn one provender. There is a lot more to say about supply, but we will see that later. For the moment, Lord Vladislav has not enough carts to supply back to Ladoga, but it's summer, so he can forage. Now, his command card is over, he has a moved fort marker, so he must feed his troop, he spends the provender he just earned by foraging, and he ends his command with still one provender. Perfect. Two cards to go for each player, and they both know that after these two cards, next turn is coming, and especially, Toton players know that next turn he will have to levy new troops and new lords. And if you remember, levy actions are only possible for lords that are in friendly locations. Friendly means on your side of the border or in a stronghold that you previously conquered. Toton player knows that the last two cards he planned are Rudolf and Hermann. Especially he knows that Yaroslav won't move anymore this turn. So, the problem is simple. At least, Tutton Lords must take the fort of Isborsk to make it a friendly location before next levy. So, go on. Next card, Tutton player, Lord Rudolf von Kassel. As we know, there are two ways to take a stronghold. Two actions, siege or storm. Siege can conquer a stronghold only if there are no enemy lord inside. So, it would be okay for Isborsk, but... Siege action requires to spend all your card's command points on this single action. Here, this is not possible because Rudolf has to march to Isborsk. So, he will march, then storm. But after marching and fighting, we know that Rudolf will have to feed his troops and he has no provender anymore. So before that, before leaving his own country, he must gather provender. Three ways for doing that, ravage, forage or supply. Forage is obviously the best, so here are the three actions Rudolf will do. Forage, it's summer, Rudolf gains one provender, easy. March. Rudolf uses a trackway to Isborsk. His one cart can carry his one provender. But here we must pay attention because it's becoming tricky. If a lord enters an unbesieged enemy stronghold location, he begins a siege and must end his common card. Here, because Yaroslav previously set a siege, Isborg is actually besieged when Rudolf enters its location. So, Rudolf doesn't have to end now his command and he can still spend his last command point. As planned, with his last command point, Rudolf storms the fort of Isborg. Basically, storm is just like a regular combat. Storm is a fight where the defender is a stronghold with or without any army inside. We use the battle board. Rudolf being the active lord, he must take place in the front center box. But there is a second attacker in the location, Yaroslav. In a standard battle, he would take place in the left or right box. But during a storm, we only use the center box. So 
Yaroslav goes to the reserve box. That means that for the moment he won't fight. On the other side of the walls, there is no enemy lord, but that doesn't mean there is no defender at all. There are always garrisons defending strongholds. Garrison depends on what kind of stronghold it is. Let's have a look at the actual game's player aid. Garrison column. Izborsk is a Russian fort. Its siege capacity is 1. Izborsk receive one man at arm as garrison, and this symbol shows that these men can use crossbows during battle. As you can see, men at arm in garrison always use crossbows. We'll see very soon what bonuses these crossbows give in battle. Note that Teton stronghold also receives knights as garrison, but knights don't use crossbows, only men at arm. There is no such thing as mounted crossbowmen. So, Our fort of Izborsk gets, as garrison, one man at arm unit with crossbows. And even better, these men at arm are protected by walls. Walls give a protection die. Player will roll every time one of his units have to absorb a hit. This protection value is 3 for all Russian strongholds and 4 for Teton strongholds. Izborsk walls protection is 3. That's for the defender, but the attacker also gains some advantages. That is, one level of walls for each siege works counter. Remember, as soon as a lord enters an enemy stronghold location, he declares a siege. This is mandatory. And he puts a siege works marker to show the state of siege. A lord can also add the siege works to an existing siege with the siege action. So, You should see the siege action as a way for besieger to build his own field fortifications that will shield his attacking forces when he will storm the stronghold. And here we are, ready to fight. We put garrisons here and siege works here. For this particular storm combat, there is no defending force other than the fort garrison. Storm resolution is very close to regular combat, but with some exceptions. First, there is a maximum duration to storm combat. The attacker must conquer the stronghold in a number of battle cycles equal to the number of siege works markers he has previously put on the stronghold. He cannot take his time, he must actually break the gates and rush inside. By doing siege actions beforehand, he will get more battle cycles for a successful assault. The maximum number of such markers being 4, a besieger will never have more than four battle cycles to storm a stronghold. Okay, so here, the fort of Izborsk is empty, only defended by its garrison. With just one siege marker, so Rudolf gets only one battle cycle to rout all defenders. Also, in storm battle, cavalry units are dismounted. In other words, all units are foot units. You remember the regular battle cycle. Without cavalry units, it becomes far simpler. Cavalry units still fight, but as if they were foot units. Defender first, all units, then attacker, all units. Then again, as many times as the number of siege works marker. And because knights are dismounted, the number of hits they inflict is one instead of two. Also, in a storm battle, attacker must first absorb hits with his armored units, that is, black and silver units. In other words, he cannot use unarmored militia or light cavalry, brown units, to shield his attack. Defender can absorb with whatever unit, but garrison first. Finally, at the beginning of every battle cycle, attacker can still concede to put an end to the fight at the end of the current battle cycle, but only attacker can concede. Defender must fight until the end or until all his units are routed. Every new battle cycle, player with at least two lords can decide to switch between a front lord and a reserve lord. In storm battle, only one lord can be currently fighting, the one occupying the front center box. All other lords are in reserve and don't fight. And this is the same for both players, attacker and defender. However, at the beginning of every battle cycle, both players can switch their fighting lord with another one in reserve. Attacker decides first, then defender. 
Here, because Rudolf storms with only one siege marker, battle will last only one round and there will be no such switching. Yaroslav won't fight whatever happens. And now, knowing all these rules, we feel battle ready. Let's fight for a single battle cycle. Defender first. The only defender is that one man at arm unit in garrison, but it fires with crossbows. How does it work? And in general, how does archery work? In this game, some units use bows or crossbows. And these units can make a bonus attack with a value of one half before all other attacks and defender before attacker if both use archery. Here are the two battle cycles we know. The standard battle cycle with horse units and the storm battle cycle where all units fight together, horse and foot. If you add archer units, they do their bonus attack first. Bonus attack means that, for example, during our storm battle in Izborsk, our Russian garrison crossbowmen will hit twice First, they inflict half a hit at their bonus crossbow attack, then one hit again at their regular foot unit attack. Go! Russian crossbowmen open fire from the ramparts of Izborsk. As all bows and crossbows units, they inflict half a hit, rounded up that gives one hit that Rudolf's troops must absorb, but before that, their attack must pass through siege fortifications. The value of Rudolf's wall is equal to the number of siege works counter he has. He has one, so he has a wall value of one. Totten player rolls a three. Walls don't block the hit, so he must absorb it. In storm battle, cavalry units are not any stronger than foot units, but Rudolf prefers to maintain his cavalry for future battles and to absorb the hit with his men at arm unit. And there is a special danger here because, look, Crossbow's bolts are especially effective for piercing armors and so armored unit gets a penalty of minus 2 when absorbing crossbow's hit. Here, Rudolf men at arms see their armor lowered to 1, he rolls and misses, men at arm unit is routed. Now, next step is attacker's archery, but Rudolf has no bows nor crossbows, nothing happens. Next, defenders' regular units. That same men at arm garrison can strike again. Its crossbow attack was a bonus attack that didn't supersede its regular attack. And because it is not an archery attack, men at arm strike value is 1 and not 1 half. Again, Rudolf tries to block that hit with his walls. Wall value is 1, he rolls and misses. He must absorb that hit and chooses his sergeant unit. His protection armor value is 3, and this time he doesn't incur the minus 2 penalty. This is a regular attack and not a crossbow attack. He rolls and he successfully absorbed the hit. Now, at last, Rudolf can strike. And as you remember, because it is a storm attack and he has only one siege works marker, only one battle cycle will be fought, so that attack is the only one Rudolf gets to conquer that stronghold. Cavalry being dismounted, knight's unit value is only 1 instead of 2. Ok, 1 plus 1 equals 2, Rudolf's total strength is 2, he inflicts 2 hits that his box stronghold must absorb. But before that, these hits must pass through the fort's walls. All Russian strongholds have a wall protection value of 3, Rudolf's will check hits one by one. First hit, he rolls a 1, that hit is blocked by the walls. Second hit, he rolls a 5, that's ok, and only one hit reaches the men at arm garrison unit. It has a standard armor protection value of 3, Russian player rolls a 5 and misses, his garrison is routed, and because it doesn't belong to any lord's army, it's only an intrinsic garrison for the fort of Izborsk, it is eliminated, and that ends the battle with the fall of Izborsk. And did you see how difficult it was? Yet, Izborsk is only a small fort, one of the smallest strongholds in Russia. But because only one lord can attack, because the stronghold gets crossbowmen as garrison, because every hit must pass through the walls, and because the whole storm battle lasts only one cycle, All that makes storm battles very risky. 
Now this battle is over. There is no more siege. Lord Rudolf von Castle did conquer the stronghold of Isborsk. So, first of all, Teton player put a conquered marker on the stronghold and immediately gains one victory point. One because Isborsk is a one-box stronghold. Some larger strongholds bring more victory points, two or three. Okay, but conquering a stronghold brings a lot more rewards. First, all besieged lords are eliminated. Here, in front of Rudolf, there was no lord inside the walls of Isborsk. If Russian lords had been there, Rudolf would have routed all their units to win the storm battle. And in a standard battle, when all defenders are routed, battle is over, defenders retreat and check every unit's recovery with a protection roll. In a storm battle, there's no such recovery roll. All defeated routed lords are eliminated with all their units. They are out of the game and cannot be mustered again. Attackers routed units check for their own rallying, but even armored units must get a one to recover. Every other result, two to six, eliminates the unit. Here, for example, Rudolf must roll for his routed men at arm and must get a one even if this is an armored unit. He rolls a three and it's a miss. He loses this unit. Then all the sets that belong to the defenders' lords become spoils of war to be shared between victorious lords. Provender, loot, but also transport and coins. Here, without any Russian lords in Izborsk, there are no such spoils of war for Rudolf and Yaroslav. And finally, victorious lords can sack the stronghold itself, stealing all wealth they can find. The amount of wealth depends on the side of the stronghold, as shown in the last column of the stronghold table. Izborsk is a fort, its siege capacity is one, so its sacking brings one loot one provender and one coin. Teton player chooses how Rudolf and Yaroslav share these assets. And now let's see what would have happened had the defender won the battle. The defender can win if the attacker concedes, or if all attacking units route, or if the attacker doesn't win after a number of battle cycles equal to the number of siege works marker. Okay. And in all these cases, unlike a regular battle, the attacking lords don't retreat. They stay there and resume their siege. Besieged lords are always held inside their stronghold, unable to go out. Both sides check for rallying their routed units. Defenders check as usual, with usual protection values, but attackers or armored units must roll a 1 to rally. Defenders get no spoils of war, even if his opponent routes or is eliminated. And that's all, siege goes on. The only way to end the siege is to open the doors and attack the besieging forces in the plain without the protection of stronghold's walls. That is the sally action, and we will see it later. Rudolf's command card is over. All lords that moved or fought are marked with a moved fought counter, and that includes Yaroslav, who took part in the storm battle even if he stayed in reserve. They both must feed their troops. Rudolf spends one provender, Yaroslav spends one loot, and that's all for Rudolf's command card. Next card, Russian player Vladislav. And here is a tough decision for the Russian player. Izborsk has just fallen, Pskov is under siege, Teton threat is great in the south and Vladislav could run to help save him Pskov. But there's still Knud and Abel in the north, lurking on the shore of the Baltic Sea, ready to raid the northern cities. So, what to do? Russian player knows that his last command card will be Vladislav again, so he decides to move southward in order to build a strong army before the Tetons. And why not, retaking Izborsk after strengthening Pskov. Three command points. March twice, then forage in Novgorod, gain one provender and use it immediately to feed his troops. Next card, the last Teton card, Herman. Herman is currently besieging Gavrilo inside the walls of Pskov. Gavrilo has still a quite strong army, and Pskov is a city that gets three garrison crossbowmen units in case of storm, and 
thick walls. Far too risky. Herman could stay here and maintain Skov siege, but this is the end of this turn. Next turn will start with a levy phase, where Herman's three lordship points will be essential. Levy actions are only possible in friendly location. Pskov is not a friendly location. If Herman stays here, he won't get a levy phase next turn. Hopefully, Rudolf just conquered Isborsk, so Isborsk became a friendly location. Herman decides to fall back on Isborsk, joining Rudolf and Yaroslav. For this short movement, he must use a trackway, but he has no cart, but only boats. In other words, his transport capacity on trackways is zero. So, Herman cannot carry at all any provender and must discard them. On the other hand, loot is basically cattle and can walk by itself, but cattle is slow, and a lord with loot is always laden and must pay two command points for one march. So, for his first two command points, Herman marches to Isborsk. Then, he forages as Isborsk is now a friendly stronghold. He gains one provender. Hand of his command card, he has a move fort marker. He spent one provender to feed his army. Leaving Pskov, this ends the state of siege. Gavrilo is now free to leave the city and go wherever he wants. And last card for this campaign, Russian card, Vladislav. Vladislav just goes on his way. He marches along two trackways and forage his provender. Then he feeds his troops and it's over. Campaign is over in this first half of summer 1240. Teuton forces entered Russian territory, pillaged some locations, and took the fort of Izborsk. But they didn't conquer the city of Pskov, and with some reinforcement coming, it appears that Pskov will be a hard nut to crack. After the levy, after the campaign, we end the turn with the wastage phase. Wastage is because even if you do as best as you can, you will lose assets, just because time goes by. Lord by lord, you consider all assets each lord owns. There are seven asset categories, provender, loot, coins, carts, boats, sleds, and ships. If one category contains more than one component, that lord must lose one asset, not necessarily one asset from this category. Let's start with Knut and Abel. This lord has two assets in three categories. He must lose one asset. He chooses to lose one provender. Herman, he has two assets in the boat category. He must lose one asset, but not especially a boat. He chooses to lose his loot asset and keep his boats. Rudolf and Castle, with no category greater than one, he doesn't lose anything and so on for every lord for both players. And that's all for this first video. With the next video, we will dig deeper into the rules. We will learn more about taking and defending strongholds and building bigger armies. We will also enter the secrets of the art of war. We will see how lords join and leave the war. And we will learn some funny stuff like how to sail on the Baltic Sea, and how to deal with Wilhelm of Modena, legate of the Pope, and the Vece of Novgorod.